please stand as we sing Majesty. be seated. Happy Sabbath, church. How are you all doing today? I would first like to announce that today is our children's church. Uh, children through ages three through the sixth grade, there is a church service for you in the junior early teen room, otherwise known as the multi-purpose room, throughout the entire church service but we would ask that younger children be escorted by their parents. So if you would like to attend that today, it is again in the junior early teen room. And um, Pastor has something to say about the skills and talent survey, which is inside your bulletin. Good morning. It's great to see you this Sabbath morning. I wanted to touch base with you that uh, we have uh, called back our skill and talent survey because there could have been a few more people to fill it out than what have filled it out. And so it would help us, our nominating committee got started this last week. And these will help us to connect uh, people in our church with the right type of uh, uh, positions and work that needs to be done around the church. And we want to do something that you will connect with, that you will feel good about, energized about. And so that's what we're looking at. And uh, so if you would take these and fill them out and drop it off in the bulletin, I mean in the, excuse me, in the offering plate, and uh, then we will have record over it. You could hand it to me, you could hand it to Heidi, and we'll, we'll have this, and that would help us. Thank you so much. Another announcement is today is our monthly church family lunch today held in the fellowship hall. And um, a week from tomorrow is our church work bee um, on Sunday, October 30th, between 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. Their work for all ages is available and lunch will be provided. And then next Sabbath, we'll begin our Thanksgiving season where we have our annual food drive and we make Thanksgiving baskets for those in need in our community, which will be passed out on November 19th. And on the subject of Thanksgiving, our Thanksgiving concert is on November 12th at 6 p.m. Please come out, there's going to be a lot of exciting music and it will be a fun time. Uh, please join me for our opening prayer. Dear Lord, thank you so much for bringing us out here today. Please let us worship you to the best of our ability and please bless the service today. In Jesus' precious name, amen.
Good morning, church. That was weak. Good morning, church. There we go. Anyways, um, happy Sabbath to you all. Um, I'd like to read something in appreciation of spiritual blessing. Um, Numbers 18.24 says, Instead I give to the Levites as their inheritance the tithes that the Israelites present as an offering to the Lord. We worship God with our tithe and offering because he has appointed spiritual leaders to minister to his people. Two books of Moses mention two special groups of spiritual leaders and how they were sustained. We read in Numbers 18.2, Bring your fellow Levites from your ancestral tribes to join you and assist you when you and your sons minister before the tent of the covenant law. This chapter reviews the tasks assigned to priests and Levites. Priests were assigned at the altar and inside the tabernacle. Levites were to take care of everything else regarding the tabernacle. Each group had specific responsibilities, although Israelites as a whole was a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Their ministry brought spiritual blessings. So, this week, as we worship with our tithes and regular offerings, we are enjoying the privilege of participating in God's saving mission. Amen? Uh, Deacons, please stand. Um, Everyone, please uh, fold your hands and close your eyes and join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for bringing us all together, Lord, and uh, keeping us in this ministry, Lord. And as we um, give, I pray you may help us to give without hesitation and with, um, with a joyful heart. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. All right, so the song that we're going to be singing, uh, our first is going to ask a question. It's, it's in my language, so yeah, you're probably not going to understand it. But um, the, it's, it's going to ask a question like, Where's God at in challenging times? You know what I mean? So, but then it goes in and then it, it explains that, like, God wants us to go through those challenging times so we can become even stronger in our faith. So, uh, it, uh, it touched my heart. Uh, even if you guys not understanding it, but think of, like, how God, like, even if you go on challenging times right now, like, like, th- like, want, like, meditate. Um, through those challenging times and, and know that God is there and he wants you to become even stronger in your faith.
Church. I have a much older version of Petr. Have, I'm all grown up. Um, it's time for our prayer, our congregational prayer. We do have some prayer requests, as indicated in your bulletin. We need to pray for David Suglio, his health, that's a Brendan Begin's son. Uh, Norma Amatangelo, or Angelo maybe, that's Brenda Begin's son, needs healing. Pray for Lucky Minester, who is recovering from surgery. Laborers to go and serve in surrounding communities. You know, the harvest is ready and plentiful, but laborers are few. So we need to pray for that. And we have also Bill and uh, Jan's brother-in-law, Jim Phillips, who needs healing from cancer. Uh, no, actually, no, no additional prayer requests that you have? No? Okay, we're good. Uh, if you would all please... Kneel with me as we have our prayer. Gracious, gracious Heavenly Father, uh, we are grateful to be here today. We are grateful for the blessings that we receive for a place to worship, but do it freely. Not everybody in this world is so lucky to have it, and yet we seem to take it for granted. We ask for your strength, for your wisdom, as uh, we contemplate the things we can do for your church as we fill out those skill surveys, and just because we may not be good at something, if there is a need and we step out in faith, we know you will provide. In our congregation today, there are many who are ill, and many who are sick, many who need your loving hand and your healing hand and your healing touch. The people that are listed and that we've mentioned before this are in need of your help, but no matter what, we also need to understand and we need to pray that your will be done. And if it is your plan that we are healed from all these illnesses, that means we get to serve you a little bit longer. But if we don't, we are grateful that we can go to rest and wait for your soon coming. Thank you for the blessings you bestow upon us. Thank you for our wonderful family and friends, whether in our own, with our own family circle or our church family. Be with us today. Thank you for the Sabbath. Amen. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the works thy hand has made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, Thy power throughout the universe display. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin then sings my soul my Savior God to thee Thou art. Then sings my 
so great to have our young people here in the service today and they make really the service special. Thank you so much for music and helping with the service. We appreciate you and God bless you. Once again, we're in the middle of election season and it would seem that we would finally learn the routine when it comes to politics and election time, politicians will go to great lengths to promise you what they will do for you if they get elected. Isn't that right? They promise to make a better society, therefore their work is to make a better government. And the problem is very few of them uh, actually keep their promises. Have you found that to be true? Let's take presidential campaigns, for example. Back in the turn of the 20th century, Woodrow Wilson pledged in 1916 to keep the U.S. out of the Great War. That was World War I. His promise was broken, though, in 1917 when we declared war on Germany. You know, our people knew what war meant. They still had many of them fresh in their minds the civil war that our country went through. They knew the cost, and they knew that they did not want to lose our young men, especially in war on foreign soil. So needless to say, they were disappointed at failed government. Herbert Hoover's pledge in 1928 was to end poverty in America, and he famously promised to put a chicken in every pot and a car in every backyard. The promise was broken within a year, and it was the worst economic depression our country has ever seen. And people always refer to, seniors will refer to that. Again, what a great disappointment in our government just to think what a terrible time it was for millions of people who faced hunger and poverty all throughout the United States. Franklin Roosevelt pledged in 1932 to maintain balanced budgets, budgets and to decrease government spending by 25%, as well as a pledge in 1940 to keep us out of World War II. All of those promises were broken. U.S. citizens heard this before, but this time it was a triple header. All three of his big promises had failed. Once again, there was understanding because there were circumstances around it all. It showed that our government could not easily rise above the problems that we face. 
move forward. Lyndon Johnson, in 1964, he promised not to send our troops to Vietnam. Promise broken. Again, disappointed in failed government because not only did he send our troops, he sent more and more and more. And we were in a tangle back at that time. Richard Nixon, when he became president, beforehand he promised to find a way to make peace with honor in Vietnam. Promise broken. His promise never came to pass while he was in office, did it? It was only afterwards that it came to pass. In fact, he had to resign as president because of the corruption for which he was responsible. You've heard of Watergate. Oh, yeah. I could go on, but you've got the picture here. Why am I telling you all of this anyway? What's the point of what I'm saying? The point is, if you're like I am, you're sick of the broken promises of politicians to keep us from war, to reform society, to bring us a better life only to see things get worse. Throughout history, people have sought the perfect society, the perfect government to rule it, only to come up short time after time. And the yearning for this is because we were made to live in a heavenly society where we and government are not broken. God designed us that way. And so when it's not working right, we know something is wrong. When sin entered our planet, we have been looking for paradise lost ever since. And explains why people so consistently believe and hope for new promises of a grand vision of government to come true. This has never happened. Nor while we're on this earth will ever happen. It is simply because all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Amen. We are all broken sinners. We live in a sinful world and we keenly know that we're not in place where we were made to be and we know we live in a world of sin and we either abhor it or adore it. And I think more people are going to the adore side these days. And it has cause for concern. The United States certainly has sought to attain the idea of a better way to have government. And for a time, at least for some, it seemed like it, there were things going pretty good. <laughs> but now these days, I don't know if you would agree with me, but I think we're heading for dark days ahead. I think we're going to have struggles as we seek to go forward. What do you think? You think that's true? Keeping in mind what Winston Churchill said over 70 years ago, democracy is the worst form of government. What? Well, that doesn't stop right there. He said, democracy is the worst form of government except for all those other forms of government that have been tried before it. In other words, what Churchill was saying is don't throw out democracy with all its flaws and weaknesses simply because nothing better has come along. We as followers of Christ recognize this world doesn't have what we need and so we have set our hope, we in this world, above all people, have set our hope on God's kingdom, on the hope that God's kingdom will do and be for us what God has promised. We look for a perfect king. We look for a perfect kingdom who has a perfect government, and rightly so, because again, this is what we are made for. We have missing elements that only could be fulfilled by God. 
Today we're going to contrast governments of this world, just two governments of this world, with God's everlasting government. And we'll find that there are some amazing promises in Isaiah 11 for God's kingdom, and it is for far more dependable and uh, certainly more trustworthy than all the governmental promises that we've hoped that might have been fulfilled throughout history. And so to get underway, we need a little background. To do what we need to briefly um, do here, we need to go back to chapter 10 of Isaiah before we go with chapter 11. Because God is contrasting these failed governments of the world with his kingdom. And in this case in particular, Assyria and Israel are the two governments that are pointed out in chapter 10 and contrasted with God's government in chapter 11. And we'll take a look at both of them. For those who want it, God is leading his people who really desire a better country, a better government, a lasting government that won't disappoint and diminish, but will be trustworthy of our hope and affection throughout eternity. Is that what you want? I didn't hear amens. I'd like to hear some amens. Is that what you want? Thank you. So turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 10. We'll take a quick survey. Chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. Woe to those who enact evil statutes and to those who constantly record unjust decisions. So as to deprive the needy of justice and to rob the poor of my people their rights so that widows may be their spoil and that they may plunder the orphans. Do you think that's going on today? Do you think that's happening in our society today? Most assuredly, I say to you, it is. It is taking place all around us and may be disguised more than it was in times past. Here are the main points of these two verses. They enacted evil statutes. They recorded unjust decisions. They deprived the needy of justice. They robbed the poor of their rights. Widows would be their spoil and orphans would be plundered. Governments aren't supposed to do that, are they? Governments are supposed to do quite the opposite, to protect the vulnerable, not to make them their prey. Now let's look over in chapter 11 and flip over there and look in chapter 11 and verses 1 through 4 and pick up what it's saying there. Here the Messiah is introduced introduced with a prophecy about his kingdom and we'll read in verse 1. Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. We have been studying on Thursday nights in Revelation, and one of the things that we studied, it was the seven-fold spirit of God. And this is the embodiment of that seven-fold spirit It's about the sevenfold activity, the perfect activity of the Spirit's work in the life of Christ. And it means that it is the anointing of the Messiah with its fullness and perfection. No one else has ever had the perfect anointing like Jesus did. So check out Revelation chapter 5. It is such an amazing chapter, such a beautiful chapter. When you start to discover all the implications of it, because it gives you more hope than you can realize if you haven't been there. Now, for the verses, uh, looking back to 10, chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, 
Um, we're going forward here with verse 3 in chapter 11. And here's where the contrast comes in. It says in verse 3, And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. And he will not judge with what his eyes see. He will not make a decision by what his ears hear. In other words, the Messiah, the kingdom of God, will not be a biased kingdom, will not be partial to people. He will not judge with imperfect understanding. Does this sound like any politician that you know of today? I don't know of any like that. But it says, but he will judge fairly and righteously and with integrity. So as you see that, are you drawn more to the Messiah in hope? Because that's what his government is about. That's We feel it keenly when we have been served with injustice ourselves. We feel it keenly when we have been betrayed, we have been taken advantage of, when it has hurt our family and our loved ones. And we see that very clearly. And so we're trying to understand the hope that we have in the Messiah. Now watch here in verse 4. But with righteousness, he will judge the poor. With righteousness, he will do that. And decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. For those people who are downtrodden, who are marginalized, who are left behind, he will decide with fairness for them. And he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Now, we often think of the wicked as people that are out there. If that was true, then it wouldn't be the Jewish people that were responsible for the crucifixion of Christ. They were in there, not out there. And so in church today, we've got to recognize that we are sinners, we are broken, we've got stuff that is not right in our lives, and our very best that we could do is to turn it over to Jesus because he accepts our sinfulness, our brokenness, and gives us hope and gives us courage for the days to come. That's a wholly different government that was talked about in chapter 10, that they would enact evil statutes, that they would record unjust decisions, that they would deprive the needy justice, rob the poor of their rights, widows would be their spoil, and orphans would be plundered. That sounds more like today. Is justice working the way it's supposed to? Would you say that things are pretty broken or perhaps even broken beyond repair? There's a lot of people out there that believe that we're going to overcome all this turmoil that we're in. And if for some reason we get some kind of a reprieve for all the entanglement of our society, it will be short-lived. So, he now came to the point that regretfully, because the children of Israel were insisted on rebellion, were insisted on injustice, you know, at that time, in Isaiah's time, the people were very wealthy, their nation was very prosperous, and because of their prosperity, they used every angle they could get to edge in on getting more prosperity. Does that sound familiar to you? In our day and age in which we live? That people never can get enough? They always look for more? 
The children of Israel turn their back on God and become, become totally selfish. And because they were unrelenting in their quest, and patient as God was, and try as he might, God could do nothing more with them. And that's a pretty fearful thing. If it comes to the point that God can do nothing more with us. So regretfully now he knew that they had fulfilled what they desired and he had to take care of that. We as humans can cause a mess to happen. Isn't that true? We can cause everything to unravel. And if it were you or me, I would imagine it would be like one of those terribly frustrating days where everything was going wrong at once. God was using the nation of Assyria. And it's really an entanglement. And if you try to read through chapter 10, you're going to get confused. It's very confusing in there. But I'm trying to bring you the skinny. I'm trying to bring you to the point. God's plan was to use Assyria to bring destruction to the Israelites, to his people, because they were so stubborn, they were so insistent on doing their way. But in the process, the Assyrians had become so proud and so arrogant and pompous that they themselves began taking credit for masterminding the destruction of Israel and saying it was because of their wisdom and their military might that they were able to overtake Israel and they were doing it with unusual cruelty. So God said then he would cause a burning fire and a terrible disease to fall on both Israel and Assyria. I think God's heart is broken when his people are not paying attention to what really matters in life. I think God's heart is broken when he sees the degradation of man and how man treats mankind. But he was fed up. He was fed up with both sides. But here's the good news. God preserved a remnant. Even though it was a small portion, there was a remnant that God preserved that people who knew they were sinful, knew they were erring, but yet kept on turning back to God, yet kept on pointing back to him because they realized what they were doing was such a mess that they needed help that what they saw around them couldn't do. And I hope that we are the same way, that we recognize that with our mess, we come and just lay it before God, lay it at the foot of the cross, and that's when God can do something with us. But it's when we hold on, and when we think we're all that, when we think we're better, that we think that we're okay, that we put ourselves on a higher plane, that's when he's got a problem. Because simply we're not. We're struggling like everybody else is. So, meant that thousands of Israelites, out of all the thousands of Israelites that were there at that time, there were only a few who remained true to God and who th thick and thin remained faithful to him. And it, it was this remnant who recognized their sin, who acknowledged that they had turned their back on God, but now have repented. So God says, he will bring them back to Zion. He'll bring those people back, this remnant. And it was those who were arrogant and proud, those who were selfish and wise in their own eyes, that God could do nothing with at all with those people, and he had to cast out. It reminds me of the passage in Matthew 7, verse 13, where Jesus says, Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow 
that leads to life. And there are few who find it. God have mercy on us. Switch gears a little bit. Have you noticed that paradise is for sale? At least that's what they want you to think. They want you to think that you can purchase peace, that you could buy your slice of heaven, that you could have some kind of utopia here on this earth. That's what the marketers are selling. Can you? Really? Have you noticed how the luxurious homes that have already been classified as mansions are just not big enough, so these are traded in for bigger and better ones? You see movie stars and musicians and even politicians and their, their grand estates Fit for a king. You see boats and then yachts. And then Jan and I, several years ago, and I may mention this before, several years ago, we're down in Fort Lauderdale. We stayed at a hotel, and there it was uh, on the edge of a uh, harbor where they had a bunch of very, very nice boats. And we heard that there was a restaurant right out the inn, and it was about a half a mile walk, and we were hungry, and we were wanting to get something to eat, and so um, we went and walked out there, and the further out we walked, the bigger the boats got. And right before we got to the re restaurant, there was one boat that was 268 feet long. Four stories. It was beautiful. It was immaculate. And as we were walking by, we saw some of the hands on deck, and they were working, looking like getting things ready. And we just ventured over and just, uh, uh, hey, tell me about this boat. And we had a conversation that was brewing, and it was interesting, and found out that they were getting ready to use this boat, and it belonged to somebody that, whose name we knew very well. His name was Steven Spielberg. And he was telling us about this boat and all the different things and how many crew members it took to run it and uh, the long trips it was taken. And he used it to go film. He bought it originally for $200 million, and that was like 15 years ago, to film Jurassic Park and the series. And he said, um, yeah, and Spielberg is, he's not satisfied with this boat, so he's going to get one that is a lot bigger. When is enough enough? There are airplanes, there are paradise vacation spots, there are so many things that the marketplace tries to get you to sense a need for a well-deserved break from the rat race. And yes, we need to have rest. And yes, we need to enjoy time away. So your destination is where you can go and get some peace and relaxation that you've been longing for. And you should know it's all for a pretty hefty price. <laughs> And it's for a very limited time. In other words, you will have just enough time to get you to your destination and just to, enough time at your destination, then before you know it, it's time to leave because this whole thing is fleeting. But God's destination is not fleeting. And it's the most expensive vacation spot, place of peace, much more expensive than what it costs people here on this earth. Because it costs Jesus his life. And he paid 
for our redemption. So God's plan is so different from the way we do things. And so to put this in perspective, you have to know at the time Isaiah wrote this, almost 3,000 years ago, believe it or not, the Jews and Assyrians were a war-torn people. There was danger on every side. There, was no, there were no good medical facilities to help you if you're wounded in battle, and imagine that. We are a spoiled culture with our medical care. And we're enjoying long life these days simply because we didn't have it much like the people back in those days. We have so much more of a peaceful living context than they could have ever imagined, but yet we still know it's not right. And so here's the picture for them, and it is for us as well, because everything about God's plan for all his children is incredibly amazing. It's incredibly wonderful. It tells us about peace and what absolute peace and contentment is that you will find in God's kingdom. And I invite you to go to chapter 11 of Isaiah and starting with verse 6. And it gives this slice, this little piece of what we can expect in heaven. And again, it's more meaningful to people back at the time of Isaiah's day than maybe for us, but it does give us an, a, be a beautiful aroma of peace. It says, and the wolf will dwell with the lamb. Any of you farmers out there? And the leopard will lie down with the young goat. And the calf and the young lion and the fatling together. And a little boy will lead them. Also the cow and the bear will graze. Their young will lie down together. And the lion will eat straw like an ox. The nursing child will play by the hole of a cobra. And the weaned child will put his hand on the viper's den. They will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. One slice of heaven. How God describes for us. Human governments and societies cannot be characterized by perfect peace because of the seething wickedness of our natural hearts. On the other hand, because of the righteousness and the power of Christ's judgments, there will only be perfect peace forever in his kingdom. Verses 6 through 9 capture the peace that he has with powerful imagery. Animals that would naturally have been enemies, wolves and lambs, leopards and goats, calves and lions, will be in complete harmony with one another. And there will be no fear in his kingdom. And we can leave all our junk at the door. Those parts about us that we know we wrestle with, that we don't like, when we go to heaven, we will leave those outside. They will never torment or bother us again. Now, you want an expensive vacation where you have to pay and dip into your savings to do that? Or do you want a place in heaven where the promise is like so amazing? Keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on God and his kingdom and what he's doing because what he's doing now, he is very active now even though more and more people in droves are leaving the presence of God in their lives, he is doing more in the world than what we realize. The 
The consummation of that kingdom was captured very powerfully in verse 9. I'm going to share it one more time with you. It says, they will not hurt. And I'm not only going to say it would be uh, exclusive to animals. It would be nobody that would hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Have you ever crossed the ocean on a ship? Have you ever crossed the ocean even from the air? Because once you get up in the air and you look down and you realize, oh, we're leaving continental United States and we're heading overseas, there's a vastness to the waters of the oceans. And God says, <laughs> all that's covered. All that's taken care of. All that is, I've got it. We no longer will study how to kill one another or how to feed our lusts. Redeemed sinners will study the glory of the Lord in all aspects of his magnificent creation. There's so much more I could say here, but this is what I want to leave you with. We need to look beyond the externals and focus on the eternal. We need to move every day away from the here and now and what consumes our attention, our thoughts, our minds, our activities, and focus on the there and then. where Jesus is preparing us now for that day. Listen to what A.W. Tozer wrote some years ago. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Let me say that again. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. The gravest question before the church is always God himself. And the most portentous fact about any man is not what he at any given time may say or do, but what is deep in his heart that he conceives God to be like. Don't you know that God is more interested in your internals than your externals? That God loves you so deeply, he knows what troubles your heart and what's on your heart and how he wants to fashion and form you to his character. And so if our attention is all on the externals around it, how can God ever do the work he wants to do inside of us? We tend by a secret law of the soul to move towards our mental image of God. What's he saying here? We tend by a secret law of the soul to move towards our mental image of God. Well, that means what we're focused on is that is what we will become. By beholding him, what? We become changed. So he's saying the secret to who you really are and the key to your future is not your self-image, but your God image. Do you have God in focus? Do you know that God is for you? That God is working for you in your behalf? Do you know that he cares deeply about the struggles you're facing in life? cares deeply about the challenges that are before you. There is a grace for us worthy of no one less than God beyond all we can ask or imagine. Isaiah concludes his sermon about grace for Israel's failure with a vision of the messianic kingdom beautiful enough to heighten our view of God. And as we see it, as we get it, as we understand it, why are we wasting so much time on the stuff here? 
because that's not going to be important in the long haul. The spiritual is what is important. To see God as our king of grace, laboring to take us there despite what we deserve, to see Jesus who came to rescue us from this dark foreboding planet, and to see my sinfulness and my brokenness, and know that God still wants me to be a part of his kingdom, (laughs) that we can come without price. Oh, it cost, again, it cost Jesus, but we come without price. The door to his kingdom is open with our heart. It opens with our longing for far better. That what we have here and now is not good, is not what our future has for us. Because we know we're out of place here and our hearts turn to God and our maker and our redeemer to trust that he has graciously provided a place for us in his kingdom And so this is the question that Isaiah wants each of us to think through. Where do I get my security? Where do I get my coping skills? Where do I find my confidence for the future? You know, right now, many salvations are vying for our allegiance. There are many things that want our attention and saying, if you go here, you will get this. If you go there, you will get that. And every false support we lean on turns around and bites us. We do lean on forces that strike us and abuse us and sneer at us. But Jesus never betrays our trust. He never betrays it. He only turns to extend his hand so that we may put our hand in his and allow him to guide the way. When I'm stricken stricken with disillusionment, with emptiness, with self-hatred, when these emotional undercurrents are pulling me down, it's time to ask, am I leaning on a false savior? God sees through all that. He wants you to know what it means to lean on him in truth and have a practical faith in him alone because he is our only hope of salvation. Amen? He wants you to know what it means to him alone and have a practical faith in him alone because he is our only hope. And when you rip from your arm some false trust that has struck you a thousand times and a thousand times you've gone back to it and it's your allowed to climb it and you're now ready to go back to it again God tears it away because he loves you and when we see him time after time we learn to trust him and not depend on our own prowess his grace apart as one of his remnant that is dear to his heart. Let's pray. Lord, we're stubborn. We have this mind that um, is just hard to get through to. And you've given us such an amazing record of your history with your people in the past, help us to learn from that. Help us to get it. Help us to understand what it is that you're saying to us today and how we have so many entrapments all the way around us and there is only one safe journey and that is by fixing our eyes on you. Lord, these things we need to be reminded of over and over again. Again, because we are prone to wander, prone to leave the Lord we love. Bless us now. May these words give us courage. May they give us direction. May they give us hope. 
because we pray in the powerful and amazing name of Jesus, our Savior. And everybody said. Please stand as we sing our closing uh, hymn. Gracious Lord, for this time of worship, we are grateful. For your word, we depend on it to guide us and lead us. And we look to you, Jesus, as our Savior, our Redeemer, our Sustainer, our Keeper. May we, all the more, as we see the churning of this world around us and it's headed for destruction, we pray that we will fix our eyes on you with assurance that you have a place for us in your kingdom and you will never fail us. And your promises are true and we could depend on them with all our lives. Bless us now as we are about to depart. Bless us in a Sabbath afternoon. Give us joy and a beautiful Sabbath day. And in this new week coming, may we... Uh, Lean not to our own understanding, but lean on you. Bless us now and keep us in the powerful name of our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Beautiful Sabbath out there. Have a great Sabbath afternoon. God bless you.